All right, we still have some work to do this afternoon. We are going to present and report you to into the ground. <clears throat> but one of the things I think you'll discover is that you very often get presentations and reports for things that are coming up in the next council meeting. So this is an attempt to give you some background information. We're going to start with a presentation or an update on the impact of genomic variation on function, or IGVF program. And Mike Pazin, who is the lead program director for that effort, is going to give you just a little bit of background material. Thanks, Rudy. So IGVF is an NHGRI consortium to study the impact of genomic variation on function. And this started out in September of 2021. And today you're going to hear a report from two of our project scientists. You're going to hear from Karen Mulkey. She's a steering committee co-chair, and she's also a PI at UNC Chapel Hill. You'll also be hearing from Jesse Ingritz. He's one of the leads of the project design working group and a PI from Stanford. So take it away, Karen and Jesse. Thank you. All right, good afternoon. So today we will tell you about the challenges yeah. that drive the need for the IGVF consortium, the unique opportunities the consortium is designed to address, and our progress towards these goals since the consortium launched three years ago. I will describe the challenges and goals, and then Jesse will talk about our progress, especially describing example projects among many where investigators have come together and achieved early success. We'll end by describing the data resource that the consortium is building for and with the genetics community. NHGRI's 2020 strategic vision identified several grand challenges in genomics, including this one. The discovery of genomic variation and the rate of variant discovery have increased tremendously through genotyping and sequencing in increasingly diverse populations, identifying more complex types of genome variants. And enormous numbers of associations have been identified between variants and phenotypes, including both common and rare diseases and related traits. But our understanding of how the variants affect genome function and phenotype, such as disease risk, has not kept up. To learn how variants affect disease risk, several aspects of mechanisms need to be determined. Variants may function differently depending on tissue or cell type environment. Some variants, for example, act through context-dependent regulatory elements to influence gene expression some more directly on protein function, and some variants in genes can act in networks. Some effects may be detected as an effect on cell function, and some effects are better detected in organoids or in animal models such as mice. Especially large challenges right now include the billions of potential variants when it's not feasible to experimentally test them all, the hundreds to thousands of cell types and cell states, identifying not just plausible associations, but causal effects, integrating across coding and non-coding variants and across disease states, and building an infrastructure to organize, manage, and usefully share an enormous number of results within the community. Successful mapping of the connections could reveal fundamental insights into genome and disease biology, guide diagnosis or clinical management of rare diseases, and reveal new genes, relevant cell types, and pathways that contribute to health and disease and that guide development of new therapies. Ideally, we envision creating a genome-wide catalog of resources that would be comprehensive, that would allow a user to look up any variant and learn about its function or its predicted function in any cell type environment. Data in the catalog would be generated with validated experimental methods, uniformly processed with well-calibrated output. Methods would be well-documented so others can apply them. Predictions would be benchmarked versus gold standards, and a new catalog should be interoperable with other NIH resources. So a goal in IGVF is to accelerate building such a resource. 
The IGVF Consortium has launched to address five main opportunities. Functional characterization centers are testing variant impact using assays such as uh, CRISPR-based genome editing and large-scale studies of regulatory activity. Mapping centers are identifying regulatory elements and gene expression in many cell types and cell states. And as it is still not possible to perturb all variants in all contexts, predictive modeling projects are building advanced computational models that use high throughput data to make causal inferences and predict additional effects. Regulatory network teams are putting together multiple types of data to understand how variants can affect genes in different contexts to influence pathways. IGVF is strong in each of these areas, providing unique opportunities that are not possible in any single lab or in previous large-scale projects. So together with the data coordinating centers, the consortium is addressing this immense task of developing assay benchmarks and uniform data processing pipelines to ultimately host all the results in a data portal and catalog to advance discoveries beyond the consortium. The court consortium currently includes more than 100 funded labs. We came together during a first year designated for planning. We developed working groups um, to organize major activities. We identified synergies and opportunities to work together, and we initiated collaborative projects. We built a strong training environment to develop a pipeline of genomics researchers with key roles for graduate students, postdocs, staff, and junior faculty. Through an affiliate process, at least 27 additional groups have now joined the consortium and participate in activities. And IGVF has established relationships with other NHGRI-funded consortia, including ClinGen, Gregor, the Human Pan Genome Project, and others. So our outputs will be compatible and helpful to each other. At the end of the planning year, we had set goals for IGVF now described in a marker paper on archive and in press, we concluded that we needed to focus on two key outcomes. First is to build infrastructure for a resource, including a data model, standards and pipelines to generate a catalog that accelerates progress throughout the community, even beyond the span of IGBF. And second is to apply these resources to gain initial insights into how variants work to alter genome function with applications to disease across a wide array of contexts. So now in the rest of the presentation, we'll describe how we're achieving these goals. So toward this overall goal of understanding the impact of variation on function and phenotype, there are many open questions. How do coding variants affect protein function? How do non-coding variants affect gene expression? How do both of these types of variation integrate through molecular networks to affect disease? And to address these very diverse questions, IGVF projects are using a common framework that combines three components, single cell mapping, genomic perturbations, and predictive modeling. To illustrate this framework and how these three components interact synergistically, we wanted to share a few examples of projects that span some of the key focus areas of the consortium. As one example, IGVF is working to map the effects of non-coding variants in the genome. A key challenge here is that non-coding variants and elements can have very cell type specific functions and act over long distances. An ideal solution would be a genome wide map of which elements regulate which genes in which cell types so that we could look up the functions of any given non-coding variant. To tackle this challenge, IGVF groups are mapping chromatin accessibility at single cell re resolution across hundreds of cell types and tissues, perturbing thousands of elements with CRISPR in a variety of cell types to generate gold standard data sets about which enhancers regulate which genes in the genome, and are developing computational models to predict these gold standard data sets from input single cell data. Because we can't experimentally perturb every enhancer, we need predictive models to create genome wide resources. Already in the last couple of years, IGVF groups have generated large CRISPR data sets in several cell types, set up benchmarking pipelines to rigorously evaluate models on common standards, and develop new models that can use single cell data sets as inputs. 
Going forward, we aim to expand these CRISPR gold standard data sets to include hundreds of thousands of examples, run prediction challenges to identify improved models, and apply the best models to create genome-wide maps across hundreds of cell types and states in human and mouse. As another example, genetic testing has identified over 1 million missense variants, but for the vast majority, we lack the evidence needed to classify them as pathogenic or benign. These variants of uncertain significance, or VUS, limit the applicability of genomic medicine, particularly for underserved populations. An ideal resource here would be a lookup table for any missense variant in a particular gene that describes whether and how that variant disrupts gene function. Toward this goal, IGDF is perturbing more than 200,000 variants in or around coding sequences. For example, using saturation mutagenesis des designs around certain genes where genetic diagnosis is clinically actionable, and deep phenotyping of selected variants across many more disease genes. These perturbation data are being combined with other computational annotations to develop new models to reclassify variants of uncertain significance. Already, these efforts have yielded new data sets, including, for example, a functional map of more than 9,000 variants for factor nine, which has allowed reclassifying a large fraction of US for hemophilia, and also new insights into how, into how disease variants work. For example, showing that many pathogenic missense variants actually lead to mislocalization of the protein in cells. Overall, in the next couple of years, we anticipate that IGVF perturbations and predictions will enable reclassifying on the order of tens of thousands of VUS across disease genes. As a final example, certain IGVF projects are focused on studying particular diseases and traits, spanning a range from cardiometabolic to immune to neurodegenerative to developmental diseases. And one particular area of focus is coronary artery disease and related lipid traits, where genome-wide association studies have identified hundreds to thousands of signals. The key challenge here is to link each of these variants to the genes, cell types, and pathways they control to influence disease risk. To tackle this problem, IGVF groups are collecting single-cell mapping data in human coronary arteries so that we have a map of all of the plausible cell types and states in which genetic variants could act. We're perturbing thousands of variants, elements, and genes in GWAS loci using a variety of different methods in three of the key cell types for the disease. And integrating these functional data with gold standards from human genetics to develop new methods to identify causal genes, cell types, and pathways. Already, these efforts have produced resources, for example, to interpret coding variants in key genes, such as LDLR and discovered a role for the CCM signaling pathway in endothelial cells in risk for coronary artery disease. Going forward, this and other disease-focused projects aim to apply the tools and resources developed by IGBF to explore how we can best use maps of genome function to understand disease risk. So these examples illustrate how this map perturb predict framework can be applied to study many open questions about genomic variation and beyond these three examples, you can find information about many other IGVF projects uh, in the supplementary slides that will be available after the meeting. Altogether, these projects will generate a huge resource, including single cell mapping data in more than 40 million single cells in cell models, organoids, tissues, and human and mouse, more than 2 million genomic perturbations to variants, elements, or genes in a variety of cell types, and predictions about the effects of variants across many different layers of genome function, including both common and rare variants observed in diverse populations, as well as variants that haven't yet been observed and have been designed or uh, through saturation mutagenesis or to test predictive models. With this huge amount of incoming data and predictions, we're thinking a lot about how to build the infrastructure we need to integrate and harmonize these data across the consortium. For example, there are over 40 different sequencing assays, um, variations on single cell methods, different types of CRISPR screens, massively parallel reporter assays. So to integrate and learn from all of these different experiments, IGVF is developing uniform processing pipelines and data standards in each of these three key areas. These pipelines will enable reproducible data processing and analysis, 
and are designed to be accessible, open source, and applicable to many compute platforms. We're also developing data standards, including data and metadata file formats and consensus QC metrics for key assays. These efforts have already resulted in new tools such as SeekSpec, a tool to standardize the annotation of all sequencing experiments by describing in a machine readable form where the adapters, barcodes, and inserts are located in any given DNA sequencing library. Going forward, we expect that these standards and pipelines, after being developed and hardened by the work of this very diverse consortium, will be broadly enabling for many other projects beyond IGPF. And we aim to release versions of core pipelines this coming year. Finally, IGVF is working to develop re web resources to share IGVF data predictions and methods. And we're working to support many types of use cases for these data. Maybe you're a genetics researcher and would like to know what IGVF can tell you about your favorite variant. Maybe you're a computational methods developer and you'd like to bulk download all annotations of all coding variants that IGVF has produced. Maybe you're an experimental researcher and want to replicate some of and, and apply some of the same experimental protocols to study your favorite variant and your favorite cell type. So to support these and many other use cases, we're developing the IGVF data resource, which has three main components. The first is the data portal, which will house raw and processed data and analysis files from IGVF experiments and external data sets. The catalog API, which has processed these data uh, to form a table database for bulk downloads and a knowledge graph for structured queries. And the catalog, which is numerous web portals, for example, to allow typing in your favorite variants and getting a list of, of different predictions of data sets, or perhaps an LLM chatbot that would allow you to interact with IGVF knowledge graph in, in, a, in a different way. You can now visit IGVF.org to view the more than 230 publications produced by the consortium to date, to download hundreds of experimental data sets uploaded to the data portal, and to query the catalog API to access an initial set of links between variants, genes, and phenotypes. Of course, linking variants to functions is an immense challenge that will require community effort and collaboration. And so we've sought partnerships with other major projects. For example, in the space of non-coding variants, IGVF is using cell models previously profiled by ENCODE and generating additional data sets in the same models, including through collaborations with the Human Pangenome Research uh, Reference Consortium. For coding variants, IGVF is collaborating with the Atlas of Variant Effects Alliance, ClinVar, and ClinGen to federate functional and clinical data and make it accessible to clinicians and genetic counselors. In the space of molecular networks, IGVF CRISPR projects are incorporating genes nominated by other consortia, such as candidate disease genes discovered in Gregor. And finally, the catalog team is using standard ontologies to ensure interoperability with HubMap, ClinVar, and other projects, and collaborating with the NHGRI-funded Knowledge Portal Network to build additional front-end interfaces to IGVF data. In summary, IGVF is three years into its five-year program and is working toward two major outcomes. First, we're building resources and infrastructure to accelerate progress throughout the community. We're developing new methods, models, standards, and pipelines, and instantiating this iterative map perturb predict framework to drive forward uh, research on particular areas of genome function. We're producing massive uniformly processed mapping and perturbation data sets and developing an ecosystem for iteratively improving predictive models over time. We're organizing and sharing these resources with the community through a data portal and catalog. Together, these resources are enabling the second key outcome, advancing our understanding of how genomic variation impacts function, learning how variants work, learning new mechanisms of disease, and improving genetic testing for precision health. We expect that some of these insights will come in the next two years of the IGVF project in certain cell types and certain disease areas of current focus, but many more will come in the years to come as the resources and tools we build here bend this curve of discovery and accelerate research across a much wider swath of biological contexts and diseases. 
Altogether, these efforts are building towards this ultimate goal to create a map of the genome that annotates any possible genomic variant for biological discovery and genetic testing. With that, we'd like to thank all of the members of the IGF consortium um, who have collaborated to, to create this vision and, and share this presentation with you today. Um, thank the IGVF team at NHGRI for their support and invite you to visit IGVF.org to learn more about the consortium. Thanks. We could clap. <laughs> Iftikhar. Thank you for that beautiful presentation. Really exciting to hear all the great work being done. My question is a bit selfish. Um, you have a particular focus on CAD, and there are two issues there that are challenging, and I was wondering how the consortium is addressing them. The first is the paucity of relevant tissue, in this case, arterial tissue uh, for gene expression. And the second is, <clears throat> you know, the first and the canonical kind of um, effect variant is 9P21, uh, which is proven notoriously difficult to disentangle. So I was wondering what, how the IGF, IGVF is addressing those uh, complexities in this particular phenotype. Thanks for those questions. Um, my co-PI here at Stanford, Tom Katermis, is uh, one of the uh, leaders of this collaborative project to study coronary artery disease. And his lab is collecting coronary arteries from heart transplants here at Stanford as one source of tissue and collaborating with um, other researchers to, um, we're hoping to get to, the, to 50 to 80 different human coronary arteries profiled with multi-ohm in the coming years. Um, in terms of understanding 9P21, uh, um, Tom's lab has uh, studied this locus in the past and are conducting additional CRISPR experiments here. Um, other members of the consortium have weighed in here. I think one of the big challenges in studying coronary artery disease as, as well as other complex diseases is that it's very difficult to know if you study a locus in one cell type, whether you've got the right answer, because there are so many different cell types that contribute to the disease and variants can act in multiple cell types um, to regulate different genes at times. And so uh, one of the um, approaches we're pursuing here is studying some of these same loci in multiple cell types. Uh, and so we were hoping that this uh, approach to capture the many different cell types and states that are relevant will, will yield some new insights here. Nancy, go ahead. So I'm really impressed with the sort of multi-layered um, results portal that you guys are putting together, including the raw data so that people who have that capacity can take those data and analyze them in different ways, but also lots of intermediate results and, um, and then maybe some chatbots to help people work their way through all of this. How much I mean, what, you know, we all strive to do good things like that. How much feedback have you gotten from the community yet on ways that you might reshape that? Or, I mean, has it been very interactive yet with the community of users? Um, how, how is that working for you? Because I, I'm really, I really see this as a model for ways that we need to move forward on, on this kind of exercise where you're creating so much data, but also so many results that, that people will use right out of the box. Right, so I'd say that this is a long-term process and we are uh, in the midst of it. Uh, there has been some outreach to, to various groups, but we're still very much in the building stage of putting together this. We went through an extensive exercise within the consortium, coming up with all the different user cases that we could identify and talking to our friends to, uh, to build those in. Uh, but I think that we need um, more data, more presentation ready to then be able to gain more feedback from the community. Really, really exciting to see something like this this far along. Thank you very much. Tim, go ahead. Hi, folks. Jesse, Karen, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, one question I have is, 
obviously IGVF is a you know a large data generating effort, but there's lots of other large data data generating efforts as well in the community. For example, generating single cell multi ohm data and so on. Um, how do you see the relationship between IGVF and some of these other major efforts in the field, kind of over the next you know three to five years? So. Um, one of the key areas that is unique to IGVF is this combination of depth in both single cell mapping as well as in genomic perturbations and predictive modeling. And putting those three components together, we think is going to create opportunities that, for example, um, you know, get, go beyond the current scope of, of other single cell projects like HubMap. Um, so, for example, we're collecting multi M data in tissues for certain diseases of, very, uh, of interest. But also in all of the cellular models that IGVF groups are using for genomic perturbation experiments, so that you could develop predictive models that train in the multi M data in cell models where we have gold standard perturbation data, and that can then be applied to make causal inferences in tissues in other cell types where we can't conduct those same uh, genomic perturbations. And so we're hoping that this um, uh, set of uh, principles that we learn and uh, even predictive models that we develop can then be applied in, into many additional cell types that are being profiled in these other efforts. Great. Thank you. Judy? Um, hi, Jesse and Karen. This is Judy. Um, so I'm on the EAB, um, so I've seen something in the kitchen already. but. Um, can you comment operationally on how you can get folks to work together and how the how the whole can be greater than the sum of the parts? Uh, that's my first question. Second question is diversity. How, how well do you think you're incorporating diversity? Yeah. So we went through, in the beginning, a building a working group structure and a focus group structure and a collaborative project structure. I think... One challenge was kicking off a consortium like this during a pandemic when meetings were by Zoom for quite a long time uh, until we had our first in-person opportunities to sort of build those collaborations a little more uh, solidly. Um, so I think that process is is ongoing and I think we're really gelling now as a, um, as a consortium. Uh, for diversity, we're focusing a lot on the particular variants that we are studying and are building a tool to describe what their frequencies are across uh, multiple populations. We're also focusing on diversity of the research community that's participating of the different diseases that are being represented, their different uh, 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 impacts in different populations and trying to sort of be broad in our thinking. Thank you. Are you sharing protocols within the groups now? Uh, you said you're going to, by this year, share the protocols publicly. But between the groups, are there shared protocols so that there's like efficiencies of scale? Yes. Um, I, I meant to say we were sharing the pipeline, the computational pipeline that we're developing, which are already shared and um, in progress. And we've also been sharing experimental protocols tips and tricks with both internal and external workshops, for example, in the space of CRISPR experimental design and single cell mapping. Okay, if there are no further questions, then uh, Karen and Jesse, thank you very much for that presentation. And uh, you can sign off at this point.